comes from and how much education there is to do, and actually break things down a little bit more to some more basics. Um, and talk about where refi fits in to the entire DeFi stack and sort of what has happened in DeFi that's given us the opportunity to sort of get to the next level of refi and to actually propel refi forward and actually use refi as a sort of catalyst moment um, for Web3 in general. So DeFi in general address addresses a bunch of um, issues in traditional finance through trustlessness and permissionless with smart contracts. So in the traditional finance world, you sort of have these intermediaries and multiple entities that you have to deal with in order to transact with each other. What happens in DeFi is you basically immediately get the ability for individuals to act with each other going directly through a protocol or a smart contract. And when you bring that into ReFi, you sort of get this amazing opportunity to do things much faster, much more efficiently, sort of as everyone on the panel had been talking about earlier. However, the current state of DeFi is a little bit tricky. Um, there have been a series of collapses that actually, with the exception of Terra Luna, they were all CFI collapses. These were traditional financial style institutions that, without, that had no regulation. And so when they were basically bad actors or they did things that were not appropriate with the capital that was given to them, you saw a massive collapse. And so what you've seen in the last you know, few months is sort of the DeFi value, the doubt value that's been used in DeFi go from almost a quarter trillion dollars um, down to about $70, trillion, $70 billion. And so you've seen this massive decrease in DeFi activity, this massive decrease in DeFi usage. And so it's hard to now see that, okay, what is sort of the next leg up? And the thesis basically is that ReFi can be the next leg up. But one of the core problems that exists today in DeFi, and it sort of exists in the voluntary carbon market, as was mentioned earlier today, is this is a lot of traders trading with each other. A lot of the value that was brought on chain was brought on chain for crypto native assets. These are assets that were created in crypto land and didn't have a linkage to a real world value. So if you think about Ethereum and Celo tokens and other tokens that are not stable coins, all of these tokens were basically created and are crypto assets and money pumped into them, money poured into them, and they were used in DeFi, but it didn't actually trigger a real world solve. And so what the challenge for us now is to actually bring real world assets on chain that have real world use cases. And so one of the things that the panel was talking about just now is how do we actually create real solutions to real world problems? On the other hand, DeFi has built this enormous toolkit that we can actually build on top of. Um, so borrowing and lending platforms, uh, decentralized exchanges, lenders, all of these things that are built out inside of these ecosystems are tools that we can now use and leverage to build up ReFi and build up the real world asset um, pools in DeFi. So going back into a very interesting question is where did this term ReFi come from? And what does refi actually mean? And so at the very basic of it, refi combines regenerative economic base in the real world with decentralized finance. Uh, it's probably really hard to see, but refi encompasses a tremendous amount outside of just carbon markets. Carbon markets certainly right now are the low-hanging fruit in the refi space. There are tremendously larger use cases in the long run than tokenized carbon credits, but that's sort of where we're all starting because it's where I think all of us see this amazing opportunity to bring real-world assets on-chain. So this is sort of the first time in crypto history that we're going through this dual bear market. There's a bear market in crypto, and there's a bear market in all of the equity and bond markets around the world um, simultaneously. So we sort of need to create this new thesis for ReFi that allows us to bring real-world assets on-chain. And so the thesis is basically that ReFi must create a regenerative product both for ordinary people and corporations. This is the general idea behind permissionlessness, is that it allows for anyone to access the same product. If you look at taking the carbon markets as an example for the moment, if you look at oftentimes what retail buyers get charged for a carbon credit, at the same time, it's oftentimes 200 or 300 times more than what you will see in the wholesale market or when brokers are trading between each other. That's really damaging to the market and creates the scenario where it becomes too expensive for ordinary people to use it or just an unfair scenario. So doing this all in DeFi creates a single use case for everyone that's a unified use case. Um, and so the other thing is that we want whatever this product that we're building to be appealing to institutions and government because it's solving a real world problem. So uh, there's a quote that I really like, which is crypto wins by solving problems that nobody else can solve profitably, right? Right now, a lot of what DeFi is, is the promise of solving problems without actually solving problems. It's not actually creating additional value for the traditional finance world because they don't see the need for it because there is a lot of 
additional risky assets that are brought on. So they look at the use cases that exist in DeFi today for a lot of these institutional and corporate players, and they just don't see the value in what DeFi is bringing. And so what we have to do is prove the value by actually solving a real problem. Um, and carbon is sort of this initial first use case that's really promising. So there are a small but growing number of real world assets that are com currently coming on chain. You're seeing corporate receivables, you're seeing real estate leases, you're seeing freight invoices, and now we're starting to see carbon in a real way. And we have to basically bring these things on chain in a way that solves a problem. So for example, MakerDAO just uh, announced that they're bringing US treasuries on chain and they're gonna lend against US treasuries. The only problem there is no one who has a large pool of US treasuries has a problem borrowing against them. It is very easy to borrow against US treasuries. It's one of the most liquid markets in the world. And so it's not necessary for DeFi to solve this problem. It's nice, it's a great use case, but it doesn't solve a problem that, that was there that wasn't, that's being solved natively in DeFi. With carbon credits and carbon forwards, we have an opportunity to solve these natively in DeFi because these are digitally native assets to begin with. These are assets that today only exist as contracts and database entries and don't have a physical counterpart. And so we have the ability to actually create the market, <coughs> excuse me, create the market in the first place as on chain and use the DeFi tool stack to actually enhance that market. So how do we bring these carbon assets on chain? Um, so this is a chart that was actually created by uh, Christian Peters here. Um, and so this is actually looking at two different things. This is looking at the demand for assets and the liquidity of an asset. So if you look at the top right, Apple stock is an obvious example of something with a tremendous amount of liquidity and a tremendous amount of demand. People want to buy Apple stock, they want to hold it, and it's really easy to trade it. On the other hand, if you look at the lower left, you have Russian government bonds. It's incredibly, it's very difficult to trade government bonds. There's no liquidity, no one wants them. Anyone who has them is a seller of them, and there's just no demand whatsoever for them. In between the, those two places is sort of where DeFi exists today, and where DeFi has existed for the last year. It's, there is some liquidity, there's some demand for the assets. It's looking for use cases in, in, in the opportunity. What we have is starting to see, now if you look at the top, sort of where this tokenization hype train is, we're starting to see a tremendous amount of demand wherever it's being created for on-chain carbon. And what we now have the opportunity to do is to translate that by tokenizing it and getting onto this hype train and doing it properly by basically moving through the real world use case area and creating something that is liquid and highly demanded. And so we can actually create a real world solution. So this was sort of talked about on the panel before in, in a sort of roundabout way, but I thought maybe a visual would help people um, really understand why the current market is so broken and why bringing liquidity and demand together on chain can actually solve a problem. Right now, if you want to buy carbon assets, there's a web of brokers and middlemen that you sort of have to interact with, and at every step, every one of those is value extractive so that the individual carbon producer, the guy who's actually going out and creating carbon assets, and the end buyer are paying fees all along the way to a bunch of different intermediaries. So how do we solve this? In a similar way to sort of how Toucan has built its product, the, the way that we bring, are bringing tokenized carbon on chain is by taking the individual projects, moving them into a SPV where the assets remain live, and then creating project tokens that can then be bundled and serve as this reference price. And the idea here is how we do this is we allow for these carbon assets that come on chain to either exist as the individual projects or as a bundle. And sort of as, we were as the panel was talking about earlier, one of the benefits that you get from this is that you have a choice. You have the ability to look at a bundle product, which is you can have multiple different bundle products that basically create a level of fungibility among different carbon assets, and they serve as a reference price. They allow you to say that is what those things should be trading at on-chain and off-chain. And the architecture that we're using basically creates the ability for these assets to go on-chain and off-chain by redeeming and unwrapping the assets and moving them back off chain into the original format that they came on chain, which is from the standards or wherever it is that they came from. Um, and then also, obviously, you can retire them directly from the bundle. So what is the, in our case, what is the exact like, mechanics of these bundles and how do they work? They are backed one for one with voluntary carbon credits. The best way to think about the scenario and how we're building things is we think of ourselves sort of as the circle for carbon credits. We take carbon credits in, we issue sort of a, think of it as a dry cleaning receipt 
right, for you when you actually get your carbon credit. And then if you bundle it, you're essentially taking your carbon credit, your dry cleaning receipt, sticking it in a gumball machine, and you're then cranking the gumball machine with the token that you're given back, and you get whatever comes out next. So you have the ability to either keep that exact claim for what you brought on chain, or to bundle it to access instant liquidity. And so the way that we've thought about this is how do we bring institutional capital and institutional players to market in this area? And so the way that we've designed the product and have continued to design and think about refi as a whole is very much about how do we bring institutional investors and institutional offsetters to the game? How do we create a product that actually solves a problem for both of these use cases and for both of these users that's a real world problem that they're currently struggling with today? And so on the offsetter side, as everyone sort of mentioned earlier, buying carbon credits is incredibly difficult. You're generally trusting and relying on the advice of an intermediary to tell you, this is a good carbon credit. This is the one you should buy. This is the one that's brand aligned with you. If you make that easier in Web3 by giving them an instant access to a product that they can buy and retire, that solves a real problem. And for investors, it's actually difficult right now to invest in carbon credits. It's incredibly cumbersome. You have to have registry accounts. You have to figure out and manage those registry accounts. And what bundle contracts do, do are they allow you to buy and hold the asset to either use later or hold as an investment. And so this allows for institutional players to come in and say, OK, this is an asset class that I want to be a part of and bring capital on chain for these assets, both in terms of carbon credits and in terms of capital investment capital. The other thing that we're really focused on is taking carbon uh, forwards and bringing them on chain. And so the way Flow Carbon is doing this is actually with a partnership with Centrifuge where we're taking carbon forward contracts. So if you think about what a carbon forward is, it's basically a project that has not yet created a carbon credit but is going to create them in the future. They can basically sell their production forward. These are incredibly non-standard contracts just like all the things sort of in the voluntary carbon market right now. Lots of legal complexity, lots of non-standard paperwork, and they sell these things forward oftentimes to um, end users or to investors in the space, to basically these brokers or traders in the space who look to buy low and sell high later. But this is a very, very opaque market that is very closed off to most investors. So what we want to do is basically bring this and bring the ability of using this in DeFi with centrifuge pools to anyone who wants to invest in these projects and to allow for these um, assets to basically be pooled so you're not buying in a single one of them. You don't have to do individual diligence on the projects. But these real world assets, these contracts for future carbon credits can be basically issued as NFTs, put into a pool, and then tranched and used throughout DeFi. And so the ability for all of these things to come on chain as additional primitives and then be used across the DeFi stack is sort of this amazing opportunity. I forget who on the panel, <clears throat> who on the panel said this, excuse me. who on the panel said this um, earlier today, but the, there may actually exist a premium on chain for carbon credits because of all the DeFi use cases. Because right now, a carbon credit, when you own it, is a, is a totally useless asset. You're sitting there holding the credit, and there's nothing you can do with it other than retire it or sell it to somebody else. In DeFi, you basically get the ab immediate ability to lend it, use it as collateral, or put it into liquidity pools for trading purposes to earn fees against it. So there are a, a lot of opportunities for these to become productive assets rather than just assets that are sitting there on your books not earning anything. So in the end, <clears throat> I think that regenerative finance is about restoring rather than exploiting. Capitalism is dirty and rewards are pocketed um, while the environmental risks are reward. This has to stop, and carbon needs to become a first-class citizen in the world of finance. And if we can basically take the, next, the, the unfortunate element of the bear markets that we're in right now to really focus on building out these use cases and start showing how real-world assets can come on chain in the form of environmental assets and solve real problems, I think we're going to set ourselves up for a really amazing situation.